Right, I've prepared a little talk as instructed by Theo. Theo asked if I would give a talk, and when I said, what about, he said, on the children. It's got to be on the children. And uh, the title we came out with is A Decade of Abuse, because that's roughly the period that um, I have been getting involved with understanding about that abuse. So unusually for me, no visuals. I'm just going to talk. I have brought in a couple of books for a particular reason. We'll get to those. Um, but what I'm going to just do is, off the cuff, talking about my experience of starting to understand what child abuse is all about. And I did have to cheat a bit in the beginning because, and this is very rare for me, I had to make some notes. And the reason I had to do that is because when I sat down to think about all the people I'd come in contact with on this subject, I realized that every time I thought of a name, I thought of another name and another name. And I thought, unless I write these down, I'm going to miss some of them out. I am going to leave many of them out because there were just, there's been too many to talk about. But we'll just start for a few minutes with running through some of the people that I've come into contact with. How have I come into contact with those people? The answer is, as a result of putting out one A4 sheet of paper. Because that's what we originally put out in Plymouth um, going back, I think, to about 2000, and f no, that was when we were in, I think, we, we'd, we'd already put some out. We, we can't quite work it out, but I'm going to say 2003, 2004, but uh, we started to get interested in what was going on in Plymouth, and most of what we were picking up was basic fraud and corruption. It was dirty deals, it was public money being carved up and misappropriated, and we weren't very happy with that, and we produced, a small group of us, one A4 sheet. And how many copies did we put out initially? 500. And we did that for a few months, and people started to contact us and tell us things. And they told us a lot about fraud and corruption, but they also added other topics. They'd had unpleasant experiences with the police, uh, they'd been threatened in circumstances, um, particularly circumstances within the political parties. And what we often heard was that the atmosphere inside the local Conservative or the Labour Party was pretty vicious. If you weren't part of the inner team, you were more or less treated like a bit of dirt. And woe betide you if you did something which upset the party elite. This was all new to me because I'd never really come, in, come into the political arena before. But we put out that first A4 sheet, we printed a few months, then we had a massive expansion to an A3 sheet. And if you know your A2s, A4s, A3s, you know if you fold an A3 in half, you get four A4 sides. So we started to produce four A4 sides. And then a very kind man called Lawrence said, I'll pay... Um, for an office, which was sort of a deposit, but it was easy in, easy out if we ran into trouble. And uh, uh, Carol and Kate and myself moved into a little office in County House in Plymouth, where we had a desk. And I've told this story before, but basically we had a desk. Then we were given an, a computer. I think we got two fairly quickly. And then we got our telephone in. And Carol said to me pretty forcefully one day, I wish that bloody telephone would ring. Well, within a short space of time, it had changed to, I wish that bloody telephone would stop ringing. <laughs> and the first part of what I'm trying to get across to you is all we did in the beginning is print one A4 sheet. It was a guy called Chris, actually, who did it, who had a little print shop at the time in Devonport, and he was kind enough, knowing his typesetting, to produce that. And we printed what people told us. I've got to say, in the beginning, we took some pretty massive risks because people who gave us information were largely strangers. And uh, we did check as best we could, but there were some of the stories we printed. And you thought, wow, I wonder what's going to happen when that went out. We did get a visit from the police, which was interesting. Two lady constables appeared one afternoon. And uh, they were very upset because we printed an article which mentioned Israel and the Jewish community. And uh, they told us that they'd had complaints 
They'd already spoken to the Crown Prosecution Service, but luckily for us, the Crown Prosecution Service had uh, decided they weren't going to prosecute. So I asked um, the smartest dressed of the two constables, they were both in plain clothes, uh, I said, have you actually read the article? To which they both said no. And I said, so how do you know what's in it? How do you know what we've done wrong? Well, we've heard. So I said, well, we have had a letter ourselves about the article. And she said, really? And I said, yes, it was a very interesting letter. It was from a Jewish, man, a Jewish gentleman who said it was the most accurate piece of text that he's ever, ever read. <laughs> and uh, she wasn't very happy about this. We then asked her if she would like to discuss fraud and corruption in Plymouth. And we mentioned fraud connected with Fort Bovisand. I'd love to tell you more, but... That uh, used to be a diving training centre in Plymouth where there was massive fraud and corruption going on, much of it covered up by our illustrious local police force. And as I said this to her, she had quite a low-cut top. This red flush started on her chest. Sorry, that's the microphone. And it gradually crept up and it went up her neck until she was a, a sort of day-glow red colour, beetroot colour. And she said very quickly, I think we'll leave. And they left. And that was a little potted uh, learning process of what happens when you stand up to be counted. And what it taught us was one A4 sheet can make a difference. And the other thing is that if you've got accurate information, and as the military say, you put it on the target, you're doing about as best you can. So we had a little office, and um, we were reporting mainly fraud and corruption. And then the telephone rang. And the first case we ever dealt with uh, was to do with a lady in the Plymouth area. So I'm not going to mention her name. She later moved into Cornwall, but she had children taken away from her. And that family came to us to, to talk about how it was done. Now, something that the grandfather said to me, which I've never, ever forgotten, he said the social workers were weird. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, two of them were prepared to tell me how they start trouble for families. And as a complete naive novice, I said to him, what do you mean? And he said, well, they told me that if they've got a family that they're interested in, children, they'll go into a local shop and have a fairly audible conversation about what the family are up to. And uh, the result of this is that they start rumors in the community that that family is up to no good. And I was astonished, and I said to this man, they told you that? And he said, yes, it was very strange. It was almost like they were boasting. And then he said, but it got weirder, because one of the ladies said, well, if we get these children, it means I get my new kitchen. And he said, I didn't know whether they were taking the mickey or not, but I don't think they were. The implication was they knew that they would get some form of monetary bonus if the children were taken. So that particular case led us through to a court case in Plymouth, and it was actually David Noakes who worked with the column many years ago who took the lead in trying to defend the family in court. The judge got pretty aggressive with him, but also I think we picked up, it was the first time the judge had ever really encountered some people who could perhaps speak for themselves in the court. And you detect that that family court judge went a little bit wobbly when not only um, David Noakes was doing what he did, but also there were quite a few people in the public gallery. So to back up what, what Theo has said, uh, the learning process was that it wasn't an individual that was challenging the system. There were several people, and that made the establishment uncomfortable. Well, where did it go from there? I'll do this very quickly. Uh, we had a lady called Linda Lewis came to see us who said her daughter was taken at gunpoint in America. That was absolutely true. And that girl, now an adult, has never, ever returned home. Uh, we got to know Joan and Derek Bai, who are here tonight, who talked about what happened to their daughter, Helena, as a result of Epilim and some extremely nasty things in the NHS. Uh, we got to know a lady called Corinne Gouget. Anybody know that name? She was an extremely brave French lady who um, was speaking out on the Spartan. A 
but initially she lived in London. Uh, things went on in the family. She went to do social services to try and protect her two daughters, and they were taken away from her. And through some really vicious court cases, where at one point she won custody of the girls, the matter was taken through to France. She was French, and her husband was French, although they were living in the UK. The matter was taken through to French family courts, and those two girls were taken away from her. She was branded mad, and she was never able to get in contact with those girls again. You can find her on the internet. She did fantastic work campaigning against the dangers of aspartame. But she was either, she either committed suicide or was murdered, possibly, in the south of France in June last year, which was pretty sad, particularly because she'd spoken at one of the British Constitution Group conferences. We had Oliver and Melissa, a young couple from Plymouth, who had four children taken away from them uh, because when the, one of the babies was born, Derriford Hospital said the baby had a, a particular disease. Uh, they said, we don't think so. And even when they were later proved right, the children that had been taken from them were never given back. We had a man called Kevin Bull in Ireland, had his boys taken after he accused the NHS of massive uh, malpractice when his wife nearly died in the hospital in the Midlands. We had Maureen Spalak, who had uh, four children taken, three children taken away in Liverpool under very mysterious circumstances, and she was threatened and intimidated thereafter. A lady called Sabina, I'll just read some of the names. Holly Gregg, you all know about the Holly Gregg case. A lady called Emma in South Wales, who had a little boy taken away. A lady called Elaine in Scotland, who was viciously assaulted uh, by her uh, husband, uh, but also had her children taken away, and she was accused of being mad. Teresa Cooper, who was locked up as a small girl uh, in care homes and later, children's homes later, in the Church of England home called Kendall House, where she and other girls were drugged unconscious for days at a time while they were raped and abused. Um, we had Emma in Cornwall, who tried to protect children from paedophiles, she was viciously hounded by the police and local authorities, sectioned, and I think we're allowed to say it was only through the work of the UK column that we got her out of the psychiatric unit. Uh, we had a lady called Sue locally locked up in a psychiatric unit three times for trying to report paedophile activity to the police. Oxford and Cherville Valley College, where we were informed uh, about an Asian gentleman who was trying to protect white youngsters from white abusers. He was viciously attacked within the school. Uh, his job was taken away from them. And uh, it was only after we got involved that the heat came off him. What did we achieve? I think we completely destroyed the reputation of the school and at least two of the key abusers lost their jobs. Mel Melanie Shaw. Uh, Melanie Shaw is just an appalling case for the fact that where is she now as an abuse survivor? She's back in prison. Foston Hall, we don't know what the charges are against her, but we do know she's been denied justice. What is her background? She was taken away from a, an abusive family. As she told me on one occasion, I think my first memory is my father raping me across the kitchen table when I would have been three or four. She was then placed in the care system where she was abused and raped with other girls. Um, we've got Carol Woods, a change of tack, a social worker who dared to report that she was told to take children under false pretenses, attacked, harassed, bullied, lost her job, accused of being mentally ill. A lady I got to know recently called Lou, who um, speaks about her own abuse as a child, including abuse in unpleasant ceremonies in, De in Devonport Dockyard. A lady called Sophie, who had two children taken away after she tried to better herself by going through a university degree. A lady in Cumbria called Yvonne, who had grandchildren taken away and abused by local authorities. A Polish lady whose son was taken away after she pointed out her husband was taking him to cemeteries late at night. You can decide what was going on there. 
a lady called Nilu who tried to protect her sister whose baby was being drugged to death within the NHS. And when Nilu stopped what was happening, she was banned from her own hospital. The baby was killed. The baby's eyes were taken because that removed the evidence of poisoning. And it was only by the Indian family getting the body back to India where it is still in a freezer that the evidence of murder within the NHS is preserved. Claire in Ireland, who lost her children. And then I can say, where did that lead? Well, it's led to an interview that we put out recently with a metropolitan policeman called John. And what does he tell in the hour interview, uh, audio interview that he did with us? He tells about the fact that when he really tried to investigate what was happening with children, prostitution, trafficking, abuse in London, he found that his police colleagues didn't want him to do the job. They said, you're going to upset the can if you report this abuse. But John soldiered on. He did some other jobs. He investigated the paedophile gangs amongst the canal community in London. He was warned off and threatened again by the Metropolitan Police, but was given another job which um, touched on child protection, and that led him looking to um, child, uh, children's homes, where he, he was then able to discover that nobody was keeping a record of the missing children, and he was able to establish that many of these children were being groomed, put onto drugs, or or basically groomed until they were dependent on, on drugs, and then boys and girls were both prostituted out. And he said when he tried to do something, uh, his investigations were closed down. Who closed them down? They were closed down by senior police officers. They were closed down with the help of politicians. They were closed down with the help of local authority, child protection teams. And they were closed down with the help of charities, which say they are there to protect children. So, as a result of one A4 leaflet and a telephone and a computer, this is a fraction of the information that started to pour into the UK column about children and the abuse of children. It didn't stop all the other things, the fraud, the corruption, bullying, people having their property stolen. That all came in as well, but this is what came in to do with children. And then we were called and asked if we would do a talk in South Wales about the suicides that were going on. And we took that on because the talk of the suicides seemed to have a pattern and some linkage with our concerns about what the charity Common Purpose was doing. And what am I talking about here? I'm talking about the use of NLP, Neuro -lingu Linguistic Programming, on children. And our research said that one of the things that was happening to these school children in South Wales is agencies were getting in to train them in particular subjects. Bullying, for example. Diversity. And when you analysed what was going on in the courses, these children were being given repeated doses of NLP. And I'll, I'll come back on to that subject. But what was special about the talk in South Wales we were there to give a very measured talk about the dangers around children and to say there are areas that need to be investigated and looked into. This was the first talk that I've ever given where we were threatened before we went up. There was a, a warning went up through the students' union that there were going to be demonstrations against the extreme right-wing anti-Islamic homophobic Brian Gerrish, and was there a demonstration, sort of, when I got up, there were a few people, and who was with these people, uh, elements of supporters of the Labour MP, Madeline Moon. And if you don't know who Madeline Moon is, it's worth finding out, because she's now switched to becoming a defence expert. We gave the talk, and we said, we think part of the problem is coming from the agencies who are training the children. And there were a few brave parents who, even though they had anticipated something nasty happening, came to the talk. And at the end of the evening, those parents thanked us very much for saying uh, 
uh, what we were saying. I was asked to go back to talk to some of the parents, but sometimes timing is everything, and we never quite got the slot to get there in order to talk about what extra we knew. But what I can tell you is that the number of suicides is now unknown, because one of the things that was cleverly done is the press were blamed for reporting, and they were accused of triggering copycat suicides by reporting the suicides. So the net result is the suicides climbed to about 110, 115, and then they've disappeared. Well, they haven't. It's just the press doesn't report them anymore. And across the country, there are suicide clusters uh, in numerous locations. And nobody wants to talk about them because the naughty press help create those suicides by simply telling the truth. So, what else did we learn? Well, we also learned that the media uh, was rather strange if you got near them on the subject of child abuse. And the best example for us was Oxford and Cherwell Valley College uh, because um, a particular person said, I've got a contact with a lady from um, Radio 5 and uh, sorry, I'm just thinking back here because it's quite a while ago. And uh, we had a, an exploratory conversation. She said she was very interested in the subject. And she quickly said, could she meet some of the, the teenagers who'd suffered abuse at the school? And I said that would be possible. But, of course, she would understand that these people were very nervous of who they talked to. And I said it will take a little bit of time in order to build up their confidence and to get you to, to meet them, but we can certainly try. I, I then uh, went off to do that, and we had one of the young men who was prepared to talk. When I then phoned this lady and said, right, when can we meet? She got very hesitant, and then what emerged was the fact that, uh, 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 well, she'd spoken to the local authority, and she'd uh, spoken to Thames Valley Police, and... and and, well, she didn't really think there, were any, there was anything in the allegations. So I said, well, well, this is very interesting because you haven't interviewed any of the witnesses. And within no time at all, she accused me of controlling the witnesses. It was unbelievable. But luckily, we taped the conversation. Maybe I need to get, get that tape out again so people can hear it. But they never did interview any of the victims. And that lady was pulled off by a man called Kerry Thomas, who later went on to head Panorama. And that was the Panorama that tried to squash all of the emerging stories about paedophiles amongst the Westminster MPs. But of course, it's not just the BBC. Because no mainstream paper would touch the Holly Gregg case. Not one. No mainstream, local papers did print a bit, but mainstream paper would touch Melanie Shaw. And a name that's in the background that I haven't mentioned, and I mention, that you may remember it, is a lady called Le Leanne Smith. And she was the lady who was hounded by social services until she ran with the children and killed both of them in Spain. And when the media printed on her, they simply did not bother to investigate the case. All they were interested in was the sensationalist story. They were not interested in anything to do with the case or the fact that that woman had said in a meeting, when I get promoted, I will sort this out. And what was she referring to? The abuse of children by social services in Cumbria and other areas never reported by the BBC, but a significant event in her life because from that moment on, she and her partner were hounded, accused, threatened, harassed until they went on the run and even worse things happened. So the media is not to be trusted. Is it a conspiracy? In my opinion, it is a criminal conspiracy. And we've recently been visited by mainstream newspaper reporters who are happy to say to us that they know if they get near a good case, the police warn them off. 
If they ask too many questions at the doorstep of a suspect, the police visit them to accuse them of harassment. I was given some very good information about the disappearance of a little girl in Devon called Jeanette Tate. Her bicycle was found in a lane at a place called Aylesbeer, 1978, I think is the correct date, and effectively she disappeared. Some of that information was given to, the, given to me, was given to the mainstream press, and within a couple of weeks I had a telephone call where the gentleman said, Brian, I know the information's good, and I said, why? And he said, well, I only made one call to the police, and I was warned off. So, do these people talk to each other? Yes. What did the Met Police officer say? There was a criminal conspiracy between the Met Police, local authorities, children's services, children's charities, and MPs to suppress the truth over the abuse of children. What is the abuse of children? It comes in many shapes and forms. Um, this is Teresa Cooper's book, Pin Down. You, sorry, that's all right. Pin Down. How many people have read it? Well done. It's harrowing, isn't it? The, the Church of England lied and lied and bullied and harassed and spent hundreds of thousands of pounds to make sure this woman couldn't get the truth out. Even when she had got all of her medical records and had got other girls, found them, located them, got them to come forward, and their medical records showed that for months, years, they were given doses of um, psychotropic drugs and other drugs which made them unconscious. They were given such levels of these drugs that most of these women have got serious health effects now, aside from the post-traumatic stress. And the Church of England consistently worked over many years to make sure the truth about that home didn't come out. Recently, the Archbishop of Canterbury has had a letter asking him what he's going to do about ritualistic abuse of children. He did not want to answer the letter. Indeed, he hasn't for several months. It's been put through to minions in the church who are giving fob-off answers. It's a criminal conspiracy to cover up the abuse of children. It's not new. This is a very poignant book, and the owner of the book is probably saying, that's where it is. I think I can see at the moment. So it's called Scattered Homes and Broken Hearts. And it's about children that were put up for adoption largely during the war years in Plymouth. It's tragic when you read the stories and what happened and the particular lady who wrote the book. But one of the significant things she got very upset about is that when she went simply asking for her records, they didn't want to give her her records. And she said, I couldn't understand this. But as I'm reading the book with a bit of my experience now, I can understand it because you will find local authorities and the government and the National Archives have closed down all the child records for periods of up to 85 years. Why? Because in those records is the evidence of the abuse of children, not only sexual abuse, but as Mickey Summers has now discovered from his own records, Mickey Summers' abuse survivor up in Nottingham, that he and other children were used for pharmaceutical drug testing. That's why they don't want the records to come out, never mind the sexual abuse. The pharmaceutical industry has been paying people to try out its latest drug for adults on children. And if you really want to get into it, we have to mention a lady called Roly Post, a Dutch lady who worked for the uh, European Union. She was given the role with another lady of monitoring the Romanian children's homes. And if you read her book, which is called Romania for Export Only, in it she says that when they examined the children's homes, that we, of course, were told they're all terrible, disgraceful, cruel, well, that wasn't true. Most of them did the best they could with very little money. 
they were desperately short of money. So in came the European money, and Rowley Post and her colleague were monitoring what was happening, and they became very uncomfortable at the rise of non-government organizations around the orphanages and the children's homes. And she said, we began to get an uneasy feeling these children were being used. Well, the uneasy feeling turned into detective work that actually they were being trafficked and prostituted. But what she also discovered was on one of the better orphanages, which had had a lot of European Union money, was a purpose-built pharmaceutical facility where they were going in for serious drug testing on the children. Christina England. How many people know about Christina England? Uh, absolutely wonderful lady who took on two boys with severe special needs. But what she discovered is the damage that vaccines were doing to children. Perfectly healthy, bright, happy, bubbly children given vaccines some of them dropping dead, some of them um, basically with special needs within days. And this book is extremely powerful. It's all evidence-based. And what it shows is a government-sponsored vaccination program which is literally destroying the minds and health of our children. I would say that was abuse. Um, Ian Josephs is a man who very early on started to write some good books about what he called forced, forced adoption, where children were taken away from their parents. The parents didn't want to lose those children. And in Ian Joseph's books, uh, one of the key pieces of advice he gives is never talk to social services. Is this the abuse of children? Done blame. The truth was never told about what happened around Done Blame because, of course, the truth led to sexual abuse of children and child abuse rings. And Sandra Utley, who wrote this book, it's a very powerful book. She was there on scene, and the evidence pours out of this book, the minimum, that there was a massive cover-up of what actually took place. And, of course, who was involved? The highest levels of the British government. So, where did the child abuse journey lead? Well, there was one lady very early on who said to me, something nasty is happening with my 12-year-old daughter, and uh, she gets flashbacks. She can remember being in colored rooms. She can remember being surrounded by men. She can remember her dad giving her funny fuzzy drinks, fizzy, sorry, fizzy drinks. And she can remember other strange things. And what did mum do? She sought the help of social services, and within a matter of weeks, she was branded in need of psychiatric help and eventually she made a decision to run and she went overseas but made the mistake of crossing the border into Gibraltar. And the moment she crossed the border, she was picked up, her daughter was taken away from her and until recently she had not seen that girl again. What is significant about the case is that for the first time, a family law case concerning a mother and a daughter was held in a court with a jury in Portsmouth. And this was fantastic because it gave the mother the opportunity to tell that jury everything that had happened to her. What took place before the trial was quite remarkable, but a legal team appeared um, under the auspices of a gentleman called Bill Bash, who's a friend of John Hemming. And the lady barrister convinced the mother to sign a document which effectively meant that she'd signed that she did break uh, a, um, a protection order by taking her daughter overseas. We tried desperately to get the mother not to sign the document, but she did. What then happened in the court was the judge simply said to the jury, oh, well, you'll find this rather strange, but, quote, so that this court is not more of a charade than it already is, I need to tell the jury that the mother has signed this document in which she basically expresses her guilt. 
So I am going to give this document to the jury and ask you to retire in order to make an appropriate decision. This is criminal activity by the judge. And the jury looked nonplussed. The chairman was obviously not strong enough to challenge the, the judge. They eventually trooped outside like little sheep and came back in. And what was the verdict? Guilty, even though they'd heard not a scrap of evidence against the mother. And this is the reality of the family courts, that they are not courts. All that's taking place is a transaction of business, and the child is that business. A friend of mine in Sheffield who got in touch recently said, by his calculation, each child is worth £70,000 before anything happens. So the moment the child is taken, £70,000 roughly of public money is released, which will go to social services, the police, It'll go to some of the charities. Anybody who touches the child feeds, and this is before they even start pulling on the legal aid or paying for psychiatrists in the court system. So what are the ch children worth? A minimum of £70,000. And then we gather other information, like if you want to buy a child on the streets of Northern Ireland to do what you wish with that child, and you don't need to give it back, that's £38,000. But if you're a solicitor, you can make a quarter of a million out of one family hearing, so everything around the children is money. We had a mother who tried to protect her child, a girl, because when she went to stay with her dad's parents, she came back talking unpleasant things, including they stick needles in me. She reported that to Oxford Social Services, and within a matter of weeks, she was sectioned, and UK Column has got the audio tape of her while she was waiting for the ambulance to take her to the mental hospital. She did get out, um, but she hasn't been reunited with her daughter. If you want to understand what's really going on out there, this is the book I'd recommend. It's called The Dark Heart, the Shocking Truth About Hidden Britain, and it's by a guy called Nick Davies. And why am I particularly rec recommending this one? This is the one that Melanie Shaw recommended. So Melanie Shaw's been through the abuse in her family. She's been through the abuse in the children's home. She's been through ritualistic abuse. She spent her time on drugs. She spent her time with prostitution. She knows what it's like on the streets. And she said, this man's told the truth. I've read this book. Uh, I found it very difficult because it gets straight to the point of what's going on with children. And within the first few pages, what the man says is, of course, everybody knows in Nottingham. Everybody knows that there are young children, 8, 9, 10, 11, acting as prostitutes, girls and boys, and the establishment in that area, including the police, no. Criminal conspiracy. This stuff takes you into a particularly dark area because these are people who've taken the trouble to try and write about the abuse of children within ritualistic settings. And some of the practices they're talking about are utterly disgusting. But the trouble is, we're all too nice. We're not used to this. So when these children say, actually, we were there being asked to eat shit, we don't want to hear about that. But people are writing books because they're desperately trying to get the truth out. And I'm sorry to say, if you want to understand what's really going on, you've got to read the books. And some of it you won't like. This is another one, Children for the Devil. And what is interesting about these books is there's a correlation of information, even though different people have written them. This one is particularly powerful, called Chasing Satan, by a lady called Diane Kaur. And what is powerful about this book is one ordinary lady who'd been trying to help children in disadvantaged circumstances started to get children coming to her, or brought to her, where, as she said, they were telling me things I couldn't imagine. 
But so many children came forward from different parts of the country, from different family structures, professional, non-professional, different homes. And what were these children talking about? Horrific, ritualistic settings where, amongst other things, children were murdered. What, as Melanie Shaw said, children were murdered. And I believe this is why she is locked up in prison at present with no proper charge. Um, eye on the time. I'm getting to the end. This is a book that I will honestly say I've found the creepiest book I've ever written, uh, read. <laughs> Sorry. I'm stuttering because I had a problem with this one. It's called In Plain Sight. And this is the life and lies of Jimmy Savile. And the man who wrote this book did it because as, as a young man, his, his parents had been, um, I wouldn't tell you too much because I don't want to spoil it as it were, but they'd worked in some of the institutions that Jimmy Savile visited. And he said it was interesting because my aunt thought he was a nice man, but my father in particular wasn't that impressed. And I didn't know, but I vowed that when I got older, I'd write a book on him. And my goodness, this book is exceptionally creepy. What is creepy about it is you read the contacts of Jimmy Savile and what he was doing, but nobody knew. The police didn't know. The Home Secretary didn't know. The Royal Family didn't know. They didn't know. They didn't know what he was doing to patients in Broadmoor. They didn't know what he was doing in the morgues, in the hospitals. To which I say, of course they knew. They absolutely knew. So that is probably where 10 years of work with the UK column has taken me, us. And what do I feel about it? Well, the answer is that I feel outraged. I feel outraged. I know I'm getting a bit of an old codger, I think is the right expression. But one of the reasons I feel outraged is I spent 21 years serving my country as a naval officer, thinking that while I was doing my job, the politicians, the civil service, the police, the charities, children's services were doing their job. And what I now know, of course, is that they were absolutely not doing their jobs. And we, we live in a country where we've got, be it David Cameron or Blair or Brown or John Major, Theresa May, standing up, always immaculately dressed, talking as though they are of the highest moral standard, and in fact they are utter filth. We have a Prime Minister now, Theresa May, who absolutely knows the scale of the child abuse. She has helped cover it up at every level. And where are we now? She is the Prime Minister. We've had Harriet Harman campaigning uh, to make it easier for paedophile organizations, paedophile information exchange and paedophile action for liberty, to make it easier for them to operate. And she particularly worked on the fact that it should be okay to take pornographic pictures of children. Where did she end up leading the Labour Party? This country is a cesspit and it is now at the stage that Theo's taken us to that this machinery is running and it isn't going to stop unless we stop it. Now, what's the good news? I'm going to say that in the last five years, I think this subject has exploded. If you go onto the internet, there's site after site, not just complaining, they're pumping out information, they're naming people, they're joining the dots. A lot of those people have put themselves at risk to put the information out. What they want is for the wider public to react to it. And I think that's our job. I'm not here to talk about space aliens. That might be fun, but I don't want to. What I want to say is perhaps in this room, we are as close as we can get to Middle England. And it's up to us 
to wake up all the other people who don't yet understand the pitiful state this nation has got into. They want the children. And they want the children for a simple reason. Yes, they want the children because they enjoy sex with children, or they enjoy torturing children, or they enjoy murdering them. That's part of it. But the reason they want the children is because when they've got the children, they own the future. So they don't want the bodies of the children, they want their minds. So I've got two grown-up children. How many people in this room have got children? Okay, quite a few, not everybody. Well, the people who've got children, you know how much you love them. But at the moment, they are going to enter the most vile world unless we stand up and be counted for them. It's as simple as that. Who is doing stuff out there? Well, who isn't? The people you should not trust are any of the organizations that say they're there to protect children, unless they are some of the victims' organizations who are doing the right things. In saying that, am I saying that all social workers are bad? No, I'm not. Am I saying all police are bad? No, I'm not. What is going on is the organizations have been taken over. So we have people doing a job but not realizing what they're part of. And it's up to us to take the lid off. That's it. Thanks very much.